Okay, hello and welcome everybody to the first of six lectures on teaching creative. Now, uh, my name is Dave Lorden. I'm sure you already know that. I'm pleased to meet all of you uh, and I look forward to working together over the next few weeks. Okay, so this is the first of our six lectures. Uh, today's lecture will be a little bit more theoretical uh, than the other five. We'll be going into, uh, you know, itty bitty detail uh, about classroom challenges uh, that face us uh, as, as community teachers uh, in, the, in, the, in the other five lectures. Uh, two lectures, two and three will be about uh, teaching teenagers uh, and all the challenges and opportunities uh, that come up there. Uh, and lectures four and five will be about teaching adults in a variety of contexts, uh, ranging from simple uh, beginners creative writing up to kind of specialist courses that you might do uh, with adults that are, you know, trying to be a particular kind of writer and so on and so forth. Uh, and our last lecture will be about uh, finding employment and keeping up to date uh, in in terms of the contemporary creative writing field, which we will go into a little bit of that keeping up to date as part of today's uh, lecture as well. So what are we doing today? Our first lecture is basically about uh, defining creativity and creative writing for community teaching purposes. Uh, we need a definition, obviously, as teachers, you know, as practical people teaching, uh, you know, other people looking for practical outcomes. Uh, we need a definition uh, that is practical and flexible and applicable uh, in a wide range of the various situations that is as various as the different communities uh, that we find ourselves teaching in and the different uh, motivations and outcomes that we're looking for uh, as teachers with different classes in the communities that we serve, okay? Uh, so uh, while the focus is on the practical still, even in this lecture, we will be delving a little bit into the history and the theory of creativity, uh, human creativity, I should say, in order to widen our horizons uh, and uh, build ourselves a solid foundation for our teaching because one of the things that, you know, uh, we... we I, I think you probably already realize, uh, but what you will come to realize uh, as you as your uh, journey into creative writing teaching kind of uh, grows uh, is that the main thing really for a creative writing teacher is to be continuously adapting and evolving and changing uh, according to new contexts and new problems and new challenges and new opportunities uh, in the same way that creativity itself has done over the many, many millennia uh, that has been part of the human experience. So we'll go right in now and we'll start to look at uh, how human beings have, say, defined creativity uh, in the uh, over the last few hundred years, and see how that helps us uh, see 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 how that helps us uh, consider what creativity actually is. <laughs> Looking at the dictionary definitions of creativity and something of the etymology of creativity to give us as a starting point uh, to think about it. Uh, well, uh, there's a very straightforward uh, definition which you find for creativity, which is the ability to create, uh, creative power, or faculty, or I might say capacity that the ability to create as a capacity uh, which we have as humans but what does create mean uh, and this is I think where it gets interesting and useful for us as teachers okay uh, so the 14th century Latin creatus which is the past participle of creare to make to bring forth to produce to beget, okay, so involved in all of those different synonyms which we find in the Latin origin of the world uh, is this idea of making something, a very concrete idea that creativity isn't something that just goes on uh, inside your head, isn't an abstract process, if you like, uh, but is a concrete process, a process of making, of bringing forth, of producing, it's a productive process, uh, but actually the use of human productive capacities and also human tools to make something Something, an object or a product which is perceivable and in a certain sense usable and we'll go into the sense in which creative products are usable uh, in a bit more detail later on but just to think of creativity as a productive process with a concrete outcome something which can be apprehended comprehended reacted to uh, by an audience beyond ourselves okay so production and outcome are very and making you know something that we are doing uh, rather than uh, you know rather than simply going on in our imagination. In fact, the imagination is just really the first uh, step in creative. Okay, I like uh, Nobel Prize win winning novelist uh, Oren Parmuk's definition of uh, originality, uh, which, you know, is kind of similar to creativity, not exactly the same thing, but we'll we, we use it to help us think anyway. Uh, so he says it's putting uh, together things, uh, putting together two things which haven't been put together before, and therefore you're being uh, original. Again, not quite the same thing as creativity. You can be creative, and most people will be 
be creative uh, without being particularly uh, original. I think artistic originality uh, is something which is confined to a very, very small percentage of people. And, you know, we're, we're unlikely as community teachers uh, to be working with lots of them. Most of the time we'll be wor working with people who uh, we are trying to just improve their creativity rather than get them to the stage of being a kind of an original genius or a Nobel Prize winning author. And I want to get uh, people to keep that in mind. However, uh, the idea of combining things uh, which are already there uh, is very important for us, okay? Because what's already there to be combined uh, will depend on a whole lot of factors, okay? So one of the things you do as a, as a creativity teacher, as a creative writing teacher, is figure out what you've got uh, in the classroom before you uh, in terms of the capacities of the students and their existing talents and also what kind of classroom resources you have uh, and that'll be different in all sorts of different situations and how you're going to work to put those things together to create a creative uh, classroom. So the individual creates by putting together, say, sound and sense to make a poem uh, or paint and canvas to make a painting. Of course, they all got together with human ideas uh, and the classroom teacher works by putting together everything they've got before them in the class uh, and the resources of the classroom and their own knowledge to be a creative teacher, if you like. So you put things together uh, to make other things. That's how you're creative. It's a combination and it's a process. Now, one thing I want to add to Pamuk's definition, uh, which is usually important for creativity, is that the things we put together when we combine, when we make our creative object, whatever that might be, when we make it, when we go through the process and we reach the outcome at the end of the creative process, uh, what we have now created is greater than the sum of its parts, okay? So combination is one thing, putting things together, but it's not simply just putting things together. It's putting things together and kind of arranging them so that they become something that's greater than the sum of its parts. So obviously a poem, uh, like, you know, by, uh, by a great poet, or by any poet indeed, is not simply, uh, you know, just sounds and, and sense lined up together and stuck together to make a new thing. It's its own object, uh, which goes beyond the, the, uh, the, par the, the parts of it into something greater. So hybridity is the, is the word that we need to think of there as well as combination. When we hybridize things, when we put them together to make them greater than the sum of their parts, okay? So going back over that now, we put when we're creative, we put things together to make other things, okay? So one of the things that the teacher has to know is what are the things we have to put together? How good uh, is the student, uh, you know, in terms, what is their vocabulary like? What is their spelling like? Etc, uh, etc. Et How good are they uh, at different aspects of creative writing? What can we expect to get out of them and so on and so forth? What have they got to put together to make those other things? And that'll be different with uh, lots of different individuals and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact that it's a process, uh, a lot of the time in the, is particularly in the post uh, counterculture, the post 60s era, great era, uh, not always 100% right uh, in teaching or pedagogy or anything like that, I'm afraid. Uh, a, lot of in, uh, a lot of emphasis was put on process. Okay, and you know, I'm all for process, uh, but there's no point in having a process unless you have an outcome. Okay, so as a teacher, we want our students to finish that poem, finish that story, finish that play, finish that vlog, and so on and so forth. It's not good enough to say, oh, well, they went through a process and they enjoyed themselves, but they don't get to have something to show off uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and to show off is a real crucial concept in creative writing and art as well. It's all about performance. It's all about showing off. Uh, it's all about having something uh, uh, to uh, show for your efforts at the end of the day, okay? So a process with an outcome, not just this airy fairy idea of we're enjoying ourselves here. We have a process, we have an outcome for our classes, we have an outcome for our students, and they leave our class having achieved something so that they can then go on to achieve something higher than that, okay? Uh, so that's quite, that's actually quite the, the hard part of teaching creative writing is getting people to the end of the process so they have an outcome, and that is different for every individual. And again, we'll go into more detail about to, how to tailor uh, to individuals when you're working with groups and so on and so forth. But just keep that in mind for the time being uh, that we do work with individuals. We push them to a process. We guide them to a process and they come out at the end of the day with an outcome that they're satisfied with and moves them on from where they were previously. Okay. A couple of other things that are really important for us to keep in mind about uh, creativity. Okay. Creativity is something that we're born with uh, innately. Okay. Human beings are innately creative. We innately put 
things together to form other things which are greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, we do that as part of our human, uh, you know, genetic inheritance, our evolved inheritance. And in fact, we wouldn't be able to survive in the least in the world if we didn't have that innate creative capacity which evolved over hundreds and millions and billions of years uh, in the universe. Let me give an example. Uh, the, the biggest creative breakthrough uh, that 99% of children, uh, you know, achieve. Other other children have to, uh, you who are special children, have to have to perhaps do it in another way. But talking about the 99%, uh, the first and greatest creative breakthrough of your life and my life and 99% of other people's lives is when we put together those sounds. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, and we make mama our first word. We put together those sounds that on their own are nothing, mean nothing, but we put them together, they become greater than the sum of their parts, and we suddenly enter human society after 12 months of struggle or six months of struggle, trying to make those sounds come together, trying to make them, uh, you know, mean something. Uh, and we, you know, all human creativity kind of flows out of that first linguistic breakthrough, that first creative breakthrough uh, into human, into human society through language. We've got that innately, you know, an awful lot we, of what we do as human beings, you know, it's all around us. Uh, it, it, this uh, this ability to solve problems by putting to or take opportunities solve problems or take opportunities okay which are presented to us by working with the things that we have putting them together to make that solution to make that outcome uh, that will help us move on from the problem solve the problem or take the opportunity that's presented uh, uh, before us so we have this problem as you know infants that we need to communicate uh, with those around us we solve that problem by entering language by putting the sounds together to make sense and the thing that the teacher does mostly in a creative writing classroom is provide the problems you know at, at a level at which they can be solved by the students and their different abilities and then guide them through solving those problems which we can have all sorts of names for you know prompts projects challenges uh, essays anything you want to call them but they are problems that you provide the students with that they then solve out of the capacities that they have guided by yourself uh, towards an outcome for those uh, capacities okay so it's innate uh, creativity it's a process with an outcome that solves a problem uh, and it's an adaptive and evolved slash evolving capacity now in, towards the end of the lecture I'll go into more detail about this but creativity human creativity basically evolves uh, you know at a social and cultural level according to the types of social organization that we live in and crucially according to the types of technology and technological mediums that we use to create okay so obviously creative writing just to take one example has come a very very long way in the last uh, 5,000 years it's moved from being a hundred percent oral form a hundred percent storytelling singing chanting nothing to do with text whatsoever nothing to do with books whatsoever you know and now we, we're, we're arguably at the end of that writing phase that text phase and we're entering again creative writing is entering you know an unpredictable but very exciting uh, digital era so if you're the type of t person who has been a little bit asleep on you know the fact that we're in the 20 21st century and everybody under the age of 40 or under the age of 30 or whatever it is uh, is using digital media to create and to write uh, in their own way in their own creative way we have to catch up with all that as teachers of creative writing the forms that we've inherited the 19th century forms you know the poem uh, the short story the novel all of these of course are still relevant but they're really quite a, you know they're becoming quite a small part of the creative writing field uh, and one of the things you have to do is to catch up okay uh, now I'm going to go over that line at the end again where you see there where that's the, uh, the, the it's a problem solving capacity that evolves okay now how does creativity evolve uh, in, in the long uh, evolutionary history of human beings okay I mean pretty straightforward uh, for most of our history uh, we live the small bands of nomads uh, who are continuously uh, confronted with major problems you know like it's getting very cold it's getting very hot uh, we're being attacked by lions are wolves uh, we need shelter or we're going to die now you have to be creative uh, in a group way uh, and group creativity is a real advantage that we tap into as teachers as well when we're teaching classes and we have to remember that we're teaching classes 
and individuals, not rather than individuals, but normally we're teaching groups and our group teaching and our group flow, as it's called in the in the teaching profession, has to be going well as well as our relationship with every individual within the class. But coming back to that, you know, human beings evolve create, create creativity as a as a collective response to natural problems that they were confronted to. They had to learn quickly how to build shelters, how to avoid being killed by lions, or how to kill lions, or how to hunt mammals in order that they could survive and so on and so forth you know and they had to use what they had to hand and they had to use the skills that they had already so it wasn't like us you know they didn't have a situation where they could you know call the police if there was a problem with a lion uh, or, or, or anything like that or they couldn't call anybody they had to solve it themselves so human creativity that is solving problems you know are taking opportunities as they arise in our you know in our natural lives as nomadic human which we offer 90% of the time creativity arises as a problem solving capacity we solve the problems and we solve them with what we have to hand and what they had to have in hand uh, in you know uh, Ethiopia and the Congo and you know Africa was different to what they had in Asia what they had to hand in in Greenland or Queensland or anywhere else so human creative solutions to those problems of warmth shelter mortality uh, you know all those dangers all those you know uh, 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 or the environmental factors we have to deal with are different according to what's the hand and the different skills and that's very important to remember again we'll go into it in more detail Okay, so you put things together to make other things uh, which are greater than some of those parts. Uh, so you're combining and you're hybridizing. It's not a process uh, it, which is an end in itself. Creativity is a process with with, it, with an outcome. Okay, uh, that is demonstrable, apprehendable, etc. and so forth. It's innate. We're born with it. Okay, we're born with creativity. But of course, different human beings have different levels of creative. They're activated at different levels. You know, and in, in the society that we live in, we're not hugely in courage to be very creative okay uh, so often creativity is very very dormant okay uh, but we as teachers our challenge is to move people from that active dormant creativity into that independent or, or inactive dormant to independent active creativity it's an adaptive and evolving human creativity evolves according to social context and according to technology and we as teachers you know we as teachers have to be involved with that change okay uh, and we have to be the problem providers or the opportunity providers that's what we're doing as teachers we're catalyzing and we're pulling people forward all the time okay so let's look at some principles i guess our uh, guidelines for what i might mean by being a community uh, creative writing teacher and the reason i call myself a community creative writing teacher is because uh, i believe that creative writing has benefits uh, for you know everybody who might want to get involved in it uh, same as practicing music or practicing art or taking music lessons or taking art lessons or taking any kind of a creative outlet uh, for a human being is going to uh, if properly taught and properly guided and properly facilitated uh, is going to improve uh, their sense of self-esteem increase their self-confidence and expand their horizons and really if you wanted uh, you know a, 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 an aim for us as, as creative writing teachers it would be to increase people's own uh, independent self-confidence in their own uh, creative creative capacities uh, and we want our we want our students to feel good and we want them to uh, achieve and we, we don't we're not concerned uh, about whether they're going to go on to be the next uh, you know Margaret Atwood or uh, William Shakespeare uh, or anything like that so you know it's great to come across uh, somebody who's an extremely talented writer and will go on to be that will happen to you once or twice or three times in your whole teaching career because actually a really good writer uh, is a very very rare thing uh, whereas uh, it's common uh, to want to write and to explore creative writing and we work with the common if you like rather than the rare pleasurable as the rare might be okay so as community creative writing teachers I have a few things Put down there feel free to disagree and argue with me about them uh, when we get on to our uh, live q and a sessions in in about 10 days time uh, but let's say for start off that we teach creativity for fun and development okay uh, and that's important okay we want our students to enjoy themselves we want them to develop we're not teaching for publication you know we're not going to get them a publishing deal uh, we're not teaching for money very few writers make any money uh, and we really you know as an ethical uh, you know stance 
need to be very clear with so perhaps naive students who come in sometimes with the idea that they're going to pay off their mortgage and you know wild ideas about how much money you can make out of writing uh, we need to disabuse people of that and we definitely do not you know in any way hint indicate or promise uh, that uh, that being in our class will lead them to uh, money uh, publication or fame indeed we need to be clear as teachers that you know we're not we're not bringing people you know uh, we're not bringing people into these great famous uh, money spinning careers uh, we're teaching them in order that they might improve their self-confidence and expand their creative uh, capacities we facilitate the uh, enjoyment and exploration of our expa of and expansion uh, of our clients unique creative capacities through continuous challenge okay now the level of challenge and the nature of challenge that we give to our students will depend on the whole group level of the class okay which can you know vary uh, I, I teach uh, what you might call beginners creative writing I call it kickstart creative writing now uh, in a local uh, adult education center and one year I might have in front of me a bunch of uh, a bunch of adults over 50 over 60 over 70 who might be very nervous who might in some cases be even illiterate or semi-literate so the level of challenge that you can perform there is not the same as you might with another group in the ex exact same title class who might all be you know really uh, really very well read people and really highly ambitious people and people that you can give a greater challenge to so you know one of the things we have to remember is the expansion of our clients unique creative capacities and we have to concentrate on the uniqueness as teachers we have to find out very early on uh, you know what, what are the what, what are the creative capacities uh, you know of, of our particular or client group that's in front of us uh, and we'll be talking later on about how you do that basically very quickly with a number of profiling exercises that I'm going to give to people okay so we're client centered uh, uh, that's a third one now if you want client centered it means that you would go into the school or stand in front of your class uh, and you would announce to them that today we're writing about you know whatever the hell I'm interested in writing about whatever the hell interests you as a teacher uh, if you're client centered uh, you base the content of your curriculum uh, and your class on the interest knowledge skills and desires of your clients not on abstract preconceived ideas of creative writing or literature okay I find working with teenagers an awful lot that it's an awful mistake to go in and try and teach them you know how to write a haiku for example if you want to bore the pants off them uh, for an hour and a half you can that if you want to excite them you go in and you find out what they're interested in they're interested in lots of different things they're interested in shopping they're interested in hurling they're interested in rugby they're interested in the latest pop music that you're probably not interested in at all uh, but you know you facilitate their creativity based on what they're interested in themselves not what you think is literature or what you think is creativity or what you think is allowable uh, within creativity so you kind of leave your own opinions about about literature funny as it might sound and creativity a little bit at the door when you're working with people uh, you know we're 21st century teachers I'm going to go into that now that's very 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 important because there's a bit of a drag on people especially if you're over the age of 40 or 50 there's possibly you're possibly a little bit out of touch with what's going on uh, and that won't suit you going forward okay most of the work that I get now today and I think it's probably going to be the same with everybody else uh, is with young people and young people are 21st century creators in other words they are as much into vlogging and video and podcasting and web series all those kind of things as they're going to be into writing your straightforward, your straightforward page poem uh, or your, your straightforward short story. Not that those things are gone away, they're still there and I still teach them and so does everybody else. Uh, but like I said, they're only part of the game now. We recognise as 21st century teachers uh, that we are in the multimedia or indeed post-text age really in many ways and in a rapidly developing field of creative writing. The creative writing exists now within a dynamic continuum of multimedia and often collaborative practices. Okay. Creative writing, often we think of it, again, as something which is done as the individual, and indeed the individual writes the poem, the individual writes the short story, but the individual does not make the film, the individual does not script, uh, you know, even something like Breaking Bad or The Wire or those big creative writing hits on television in the last few years, they're collectively created. So we need to, you know, uh, be, be aware of that, that there's collective creativity goes on as well as individual creativity, okay? And as the 21st century winds on, uh, I think we're going to see more and more creative uh, collaborations being the order of the day rather than individual creativity but again we can talk in more detail about that we teach the new genres as well as the old as i've just been talking about so you don't shy away from teaching stuff that you don't know a hell of a lot of about because you're a certain age or whatever you go and research it and you base classes on it and you find out about it uh, to keep your own teaching practice up to date and so on and so forth 
we follow the lead, by the way, you know, as teachers of the young and independent uh, in creative writing and not, uh, you know, outmoded institutions that might have been around for the last 100 years and are not capable of keeping up with the 21st century. You know, so for you as a creative writing teacher, it's very important that you keep an eye on uh, what young people are doing and what young people are doing an awful lot of time now these days, for example, is doing videos and performance and stuff like that. And you've got to get down with the kids uh, if you're going to be teaching the kids uh, where a lot of your professional, uh, uh, you know, uh, income and work will come from. Uh, okay, we ourselves are creative. This is a big point. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're all very creative people. You wouldn't have signed up for this if you, if you weren't. Uh, you're probably a writer yourself, a facilitator yourself already and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you really need to continuously uh, refresh uh, your curriculum and reinvent your curriculum. You know, if you are going to be a good creative writing teacher, it means that basically, you know, within the general framework that you come up with a lot of different prompts and a lot of different exercises, you don't rely at all. I mean, I have never read a book about teaching creative writing. You know, I don't rely uh, on uh, on the internet for my prompts and stuff like that. You know, I do use the internet when I'm researching things, but I do come up with my own prompts and so my own creativity is invested and I come up with my own projects so my own creativity is invested in uh you know in, in my creative writing teaching okay so if you're a creative person yourself and you're creating to help other people create then you will inspire their creativity so the more creative you are as a person the more creative as a teacher the more success you're going to have as a creative writing teacher in bringing those uh, you know students forward into uh, you know uh, expanding the, their creative capacity and expanding their enjoyment of creative capacity we're adventurous researchers kind of re-emphasizing that we explore the practically infinite field of creative writing and i later on I'll give you a project you know to kind of get going on that and we're ethical, you know, uh, really, uh, it's a bit of a racket, the creative writing industry at times. Uh, I look around there and I see people teaching creative writing and they've never written anything, you know, or anything like that. Uh, you know, so you need to be a little bit ethical. Don't claim to teach something that you haven't done yourself, okay? And don't promise outcomes that you can't deliver, okay? So if you know absolutely nothing about poetry, or you know absolutely nothing about the novel, you know absolutely nothing about drama, and so on and so forth, you know, don't claim it, don't try to teach it, because, you know, you, you probably end up with somebody in your class who knows more about it than you do in the first place okay so you know if you're someone who you know you, you, the, everybody should start out teaching a basic uh, you know beginners creative writing kickstart creative writing you're just helping people to expand their creativity to explore their creativity anybody can do that okay but putting on you know uh, it classes in writing novels or poetry are very specific things like that when you haven't done it yourself is unethical because you can't teach people something you haven't done yourself you can't teach, you can facilitate people's creativity anybody can do that okay and lastly there i want to talk about we're we're outcome focused okay uh we don't we want everyone to leave our class and i've said this already and i can't emphasize it enough uh we want everyone to leave our class with a piece of work that they're happy and proud of and that doesn't matter whether the class you've only got a bunch of kids screaming and roaring at you uh, for an hour and a half or you've got an adult class for the whole nine months of a year or whatever it is you know you have to adapt your uh, your potential outcomes and your your, your outcomes to uh, you know to whatever situation you're in but in all situations you want everybody you're teaching to leave that class with a piece of work that they have done themselves under your guidance that's hugely uh, important in many ways Okay, so what kind of concept of creativity uh, is most useful for community teaching purposes? As we, you know, we, we looked at different ways of looking at creativity, uh, and we're focused as teachers on the, uh, you know, on the practical side of creativity, uh, on uh, putting things together to make new things which are greater than the sum of our parts, expand the, you know, the creative capacities of our clients, uh, and uh, you know, improve their own self confidence and their independent creative capacity. Okay, well, that's what we do as community creators. And I've been uh, searching for, I suppose, a more workable or expandable definition of creativity uh, that helps me as a community educator all this time. Uh, it has to be an inclusive definition, really, that everyone uh, that I meet in the class, no matter who they are uh, or where they're coming from or what their previous educational background might be or what their previous relation to creative writing might be, has a way into their creativity uh, and so on and so forth. So I need a definition that recognizes that everyone has the capacity uh, to be creative at some level appropriate appropriate to themselves getting back to the client centered idea uh, that we have we're searching for a way of people entering creativity creative writing which is appropriate to themselves and not just sort of a one size fits all uh, thing for community educators then uh, being creative simply means creating something new out of materials that are available okay and that the the person is able to use or the group is able to use being creative means that we are shaping and reshaping 
available and usable materials, and I repeat again, materials, together with our ideas and our envisioning of our, our, of our future creative product and so on, uh, that we do all this in a more or less conscious manner in order to tell a story, okay, or impart a message about, for example, ourselves or the world we inhabit. So we're trying to tell a story, impart some kind of message when, our, when we're being creative in, the, in a creative writing class. Uh, I think that broadly speaking, uh, we use two kind of materials when we're being creative. And I want you to listen uh, quite carefully here to this part of the lecture. Uh, the first are what I call uh, embodied materials, the materials we carry within our bodies uh, as capacities and skills. Embodied materials uh, break down into at least two subtypes. First is our capacity for language, which you've already talked about. Of course, an awful lot of creative writing uh, in 90% of it, you might say, is to do with uh, is improving uh, and playing with our capacity for language. I don't mean exclusively, and this is where we get to, you know, uh, 21st century teaching, uh, really. Uh, we don't mean exclusively or necessarily written language, but symbols generally, and also our ability to communicate expressively with our bodies, not only speaking, but singing, you know, drawing, gesturing, and so on. All of these things come into uh, place. Uh, for example, when you're teaching performance poetry uh, to kids, it's not just about uh, what they say, uh, but it's also about how they say it, how they present it. Uh, the language capacity, which we all have inside us, also covers our ability to tell a story, joke, write, recall the past so we can write memoir, uh, outline our ambitions and dreams and our visions and all kinds of things. We do that in language. And crucially, our capacity for language enables us to tell lies, okay? And telling lies is the most important capacity, I suppose, uh, that you will find yourself drawing on as a creative writing teacher uh, with your classroom. You know, the, I, I, when I walk into a class full of kids, uh, I ask, who is there any good liars? Li liars, I should say here. And it's always good when I get a kids, you know, kind of uh, laughing into their hands and putting up their hands and kind of nervously admitting to be good liars uh, in front of their teachers because the best liars are the best writers. Uh, I mean, uh, when you go to the opera, you're listening to a lot of lies. When you go to a, a novel, read a novel, you're reading a lot of lies uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we, we, we are kind of devilish and opposite, I suppose, to moralistic or uh, teaching or the way that uh, kids are usually taught that, you know, lying is bad. But in fact, we teach that lying is good, you know, within the limits <laughs> of creativity, of course, when it's not harming anybody, wouldn't say doing the opposite of harming people. Uh, and, and, you know, lies are very fertile, and that's something I'll go and I'll talk about in exercise later on that I use with classes, okay, uh, to demonstrate to them that their capacity for lying uh, is their greatest creative capacity, okay? The second kind of embodied materials are skills acquired over our lifetime, such as the ability to play an instrument, use an iPad, draw perspective, take a photograph, etc. And we draw on all of those as 21st century creative writing teachers. We draw on all those uh, capacities as time goes by in our classes. OK, the more of these acquired skills that we have and together with our embodied skills like language, the capacity to create gestures and so on, all the kinds of communicative capacities we have, the skills we acquire, we put them together and then we come up with what you might call our creative capacity uh, uh, and you know and we need to be aware uh, very early on in our teaching of classes what kind of creative capacity our groups and the individuals within our groups have because that's what we work with uh, you know is their creative capacity there's no point in setting uh, challenges which they're simply incapable of, of, uh, of fulfilling uh, because they don't have the acquired skills uh, that they need so usually different skill levels again I often I work with kids sometimes uh, from uh, who are basically illiterate so you just teach them or storytelling and other times I work in private schools where they have you know the latest uh, IMAX and all of that kind of thing and of course you can teach them a whole lot of other things uh, such as you know making videos recording podcasts and things like that so actually creative capacity uh, is a very very important concept for community teaching the second uh, beyond the embodied materials beyond what we carry in our bodies as skills and, and, and capacities uh, that we've either learned or were born with uh, are what I call materials to hand and again these are the materials materials like I've just spoken about uh, in our local learning environment which are accessible to us, usable uh, by us when we are being creative. What our materials to hand might be might it depends on many factors, what school we go to, what kind of society we live in, what our social class is, and so on. You know, uh, when I went to school, in my community school, uh, which was a public school, and, uh, you know, uh, therefore starved of resources, uh, we didn't have music and art, uh, you know, so it was pretty hard for me to learn music and art <laughs> in school when those subjects uh, weren't taught, okay? So that's the materials to hand, if you like. What have they got? Uh, what have you got?
got in the school to play with? What have you got, uh, you know, in your own bag of tricks to play with and so on and so forth? Uh, and what have the kids got? Have they only got pen and paper or have they got laptops or, you know, what, what, what have they got? So obviously how well developed our embodied materials are influences how well we're able to use materials at hand. So, you know, again, no point having, you know, lo loads of computer stuff if the kids don't have a clue how to use it. Uh, and again, you need to be as aware as possible about how those creative capacities uh, in the clients match up uh, with what they've got to hand in the school that you're going to teach in or whether it's your own, uh, you know, little room that you have or anything like that. OK, it's not necessarily the case, by the way, that the more materials to hand and, you know, the fancier the equipment we have, uh, the better art we recreate. Uh, you know, uh, cavemen created some of the greatest pictorial art uh, out of entirely natural and, you know, locally sourceable material 35, 40, 50, 60,000 years ago. I should say cave women as well, of course, because it wasn't just cavemen, was it? Uh, in fact, most of the time, I would say, especially when you're getting going, when you're meeting kids or adults for the first time, no need to go too fancy on things. It's advisable to keep materials to hand simple, especially for a beginner's community class, especially if they're adults over the age of 40 or 45 and they're just, you know, slightly beyond that internet age, uh, at least in the introductory phase, uh, pen and paper will do. Uh, every, indiv every individual and every group uh, you teach will have a different combination of embodied materials and materials to hand and again you need to go in and find out uh, about that to uh, help you design your uh, curriculum for your class or your course okay but all anyone ever needs to get started to get going is a basic ability to express themselves and again you can do you can teach creative writing to people who can't write because you teach them storytelling and you know, and uh, you know oral expression uh, and performance you can do all kinds of things uh, uh, and maybe you can maybe that's a, you know uh, and that that goes back a long way you should say you know oral storytelling so the basic ability to express themselves is all people need you know and to use their own words to say what they want whether they say it by mouth whether they draw it in a comic strip whether they perform it whether they write it in a poem and so on and so forth okay just for your own sake there now just to go into this idea of of embodied materials and materials to hand write down all of those embodied materials you have that might be useful okay can do you you know is it in your body do you can you play the guitar okay uh, can you uh, type at 120 hours a minute can you use a sophisticated camera uh, you know obviously you can speak uh, you know so that's your but what, what what skills have you acquired over your life that you can bring to bear in your creative writing classroom creative writing defined as you know linguistic and communicative expression uh, in general okay uh, and then write down a number of things that you could do uh, with these uh, embodied materials and your materials to hand so if you can play the guitar you've got a guitar and you can speak you can write song right okay so again if you have a class and again i often teach teenagers and there's always gonna be several of them want to play the guitar if you have a couple that play the guitar a couple that are you know pretty good at poetry another couple that are pretty good at poetry you know somebody else who can play the drums and you can do songwriting as a thing for the whole day or you can do you can do a musical for example with teenagers or you can do a speech choir all sorts of possibilities once you get a handle on what kind of uh, embodied materials and materials the hand you have in front of you okay when you meet your group for the first time, you should endeavor to find out individual and group creative capacities as quickly as can. With that knowledge, you can realistically plan your inclusivity strategy. That means involving everybody, no matter you know how, uh, where they're starting from, where they're coming from, or what their capacities are. Okay, and your tailored group projects. Okay, that's a quite it's crucial concept. Two crucial concepts for creative writing teaching inclusivity involving everybody okay and secondly tailored projects tailoring for individuals and tailoring for groups we're going to a little bit more detail about that but just remember that you know it, it's a successful creative writing teaching means you know means knowing what everybody is capable of and then challenging them to rise you know into those capacities if you like okay Okay, let's have a look at what I would say are the, uh, you know, an outline of the general pedagogic methods of teaching creativity. Pedagogy, of course, being the science of uh, education. Uh, I've got five down there and you have to rely on five kind of different capacities as a teacher. Uh, to make all these work in the classroom and I'll break them down I'll go into them in some detail because I think it's worth pausing uh, here again at the beginning of our course you know uh, where we're putting together a framework uh, to do uh, the course in and that, that's what today's lecture is all about making that framework uh, so the first a uh, kind of method is an analytic method if you see I've put in brackets at the end there the kind of method which might help us to uh, concentrate and remember as well so uh, the first method we've gone into in some detail 
style, which is profiling individuals and groups, including capacities, their tools and their skills. So the first thing you do is you go in and you find out what, what, what have you got before you. Okay, you profile your individual and your group. What kind of level is the group at overall? What kind of level are the individuals within it? What are the skills and capacities? Uh, and therefore, what can I, you know, ma how can I maximize those skills and capacities and draw them on and, you know, catalyze them credibly? Uh, the second part of that is finding out people's interests, experience, and motivations. That comes back to, you know, being client centered in our approach to creative writing, making sure that what they write is what they want to write, what they're interested in writing. Um, uh, and that they're following their own creative interests rather than uh, some that we set from the outside as our own kind of standard idea of literature or whatever it might be uh, that's kind of out the door. So our first task really is that analytic task uh, of finding out as much as, as we can uh, about the capacities and, if you like, the motivations or creative uh, creative desires of, of our students. And then that helps us to build our curriculum, obviously, you know, uh, uh, and that's a very, very solid uh, foundation and at the end of the lecture today I'm going to go into three different exercises that I've used and you know adapted for use uh, let's say in a load of different situations that have helped me to profile and you know very quickly find out uh, who, who I'm dealing with. <laughs> Uh, the second is to uh, act as a continuous catalyzer, or you could call it a uh, problem maker or, pro or opportunity giver, you know, because problem is opportunity, crisis is opportunity, and so on. Uh, as I've said already, uh, create, creativity is, is a problem solving uh, process uh, with an outcome that solves uh, the problem. Okay, uh, so you as a teacher are the person that provides the the, the problem. Now the problem has to be soluble, uh, and here's where a lot of skill comes in in terms of teaching is that uh, you uh, raise the bar for your students, you challenge them, but you don't challenge them, you know, too with, with too much difficulty. Okay, uh, so you know you, you could make the mistake of giving, for example, you know, a stream of consciousness exercise uh, on the first night of your first time meeting uh, a, a, a beginner's creative writing class and you know they won't come back the next week because you've gone away over their heads or whatever it is okay at the same time of course it can't be too easy if you're dealing with advanced students or students with a lot of reading behind them and a lot of practice behind them uh, then you have to be continuously inventive in terms of the problems that you bring the challenges that you bring the opportunities you give them uh, to develop their creative capacities okay so you're, you're, you're putting them through a process uh, and uh, you know at each stage of that process you examine where your students have gone as individuals, where your students are as a group, and you set another uh, challenge which is soluble but harder than the last challenge because they've achieved the last challenge. And that's the kind of, if anybody's done the H-step, that's a general uh, pedagogic method uh, which is uh, comes under the rubric uh, of the ideas of a guy called uh, Vygotsky, okay, who to spoke of a thing called the zone of proximal development, okay, and that's a key uh, pedagogic uh, term and concept for any kind of teaching, but it's particularly applicable in terms of creative writing teaching. The ZPD, uh, the zone of proximal development, is that area, uh, you know, slightly indefinable and has to be worked out uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, in an individual and unique basis all the time, uh, where the students, as an individual or as a group, have not not yet uh, developed but are capable of developing in the near term okay and once they achieve you know the next level you give them another challenge because as you meet each challenge your zone of proximal development that is your zone of kind of possible creativity your zone of possible development you know moves on as well uh, so keeping in mind all the time that what you're doing is you're continuously every week, if you've got a 10-week course, every week you're raising the bar, you know, slightly so that the, you, people are challenged to reach that bar. And when they reach that bar, they're equipped to go on and, and take another take another challenge again. And we'll go into in detail about how you do that in terms of course design and curriculum design. But keep that idea, the zone of proximal development when you're working with individuals and groups. You know, what, what haven't they done so far that they could get to this week? So not too far ahead and not boring them, uh, really, you know, somewhere that... that, that that happy medium in between how you challenge your students and that's what I've called the kind of shamanic there uh, you know because it is it, it, ultimately going back into the mists of time uh, working with people's development and transforming them and bringing them through uh, you know these uh, the, these changes which are internal changes as well as external changes and developmental changes in creativity uh, you know it does mean kind of guide a guided process where challenges are set uh, which are difficult but which can be met challenges are set which are difficult but can be met okay? Okay, that's all that means. Uh, and the third, uh, uh, the third thing I have up there now is your coach uh, capacity. 
okay uh, and uh, coaching is simply about encouragement okay and sometimes it's a little bit about tough love okay depending again on the on the type of students you have and the situation you're in and so on uh, that means you support uh, each stage of the creative protest for the individual groups to tailored exercise exercises you design for this group in particular okay for the challenges that this group in particular can meet or for the challenges that this individual can meet. Now, in the first couple of weeks of teaching your course, it's very hard to, you know, you don't know your individuals, you know your groups. Okay, so you set the level of group. But if you've got a 10-week course by 7, 8, 9, and 10, it's quite possible to begin uh, individualizing exercises and specifying exercises or giving different exercises to different groups or different pairs uh, within a class, uh, depending on what they're interested in and what level they're at. Okay, so tailoring means you, you fit the exercise for the group, the pair, the individual. You know, you have to give feedback, uh, which helps the group as a whole, but sometimes you have to really hone in on the individual piece of work and you do it line and line feedback and you have to think individually and again if you're teaching a 10 week course somewhere around six weeks seven week age you want to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your students something that a lot of creative writing teachers don't do okay but you got a one-on-one -on -one meeting maybe halfway or a little after halfway in a course you know where you were able to give exact particular specific advice uh, during the course uh, to the person that really really boosts them okay encouragement you know encouragement is very important okay uh, pointing out where people have gone right pointing out what their strengths are okay uh, and appraisal again you know saying how they're doing <laughs> that's all that means really now the last one uh, again something which is left out of a lot of practice uh, in creative writing teaching uh, but has been huge in, in my practice for the last few years uh, you know and other people are starting to, to, to bring it on now in Ireland as well uh, which is facil facilitation of display you know I started to do uh, and that means it, somewhere for the students to show off at the end of the course okay so at the end of every course I'm teaching whether it's just a 3 hour one down for a Cork County Council in the in the library in the middle of Cork City or whether it's a 10 week course uh, you know in a youth club or something like that at the end there will be there will be a display there will be a show off it could be a performance could be just hanging the poems up on the up on the wall of the school library whatever it is but somehow there is an exhibition uh, of the students work uh, you know uh, in whatever way way you want to you want to do that so that others can come and see and others from outside usually family and close friends but sometimes general public can come in and say well you did well there that's good that's interesting and so on so people get feedback from outside the class okay so that's a really important one as well uh, you know that you do facilitate display facilitate showing off the work to outside the class at some point of the course okay now i'm going to talk about a thing called group flow uh for the fourth uh, and how that has to do with your kind of managerial or team building uh, capacity uh, uh, as a teacher okay and the group flow uh, uh, is something that creatives in the music industry for example have known about for a long time uh, and it, or I suppose in theatrical, although I haven't read about that, but it's true music uh, that, I, that, I, that I learned it, I, where basically uh, people seem to f create together their creative uh, energies, synthesize to some degree, uh, and that's where you get you know the great uh, albums and so on from the from the Beatles and all that. Okay, so uh, and there's a study done on group flow. Uh, 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 and how that maximizes and encourages the individual within the group uh, by uh, bo uh, Canadian researchers Tinsley and Lieber kind of do, do an awful lot of research on uh, creativity teaching creative writing teaching much farther than we do much more than we do over here we don't do anything over here uh, but they talk about a group flow uh, which they identify with something which sounds Vygotskyan uh, because it's developed from his idea of the zone of proximal development they call it the zone of reflective capacity and this zone, they say, and I'm quoting, shares the theoretical attributes of the zone of proximal development, but is a more specifically divine construct, helpful in describing and understanding in a way which an adult's capacity, I think this applies to kids as well in my experience, but, you know, it's slightly different with teenagers. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the differences between adults and teenagers later down the line in another lecture. Okay, but an adult's capacity for reflection can expand when he or she collaborates over an extended period with other adults who have similar goals. Okay, uh, Tinsley and Liebach found that as adults shared their feedback, analysis, and evaluation of one another's work during collaboration, their potential for critical reflection expanded. Okay, uh, the zone of reflexive capacity uh, expanded as trust and mutual understanding among the peers grew. The zone of reflective capacity is constructed through the interaction between participants engaged in a common activity and expands when it is mediated by positive interactions with other participants. Okay, now, it's what all that means for us, you know, uh, to boil it down, uh, is that a central, crucial 
a fundamental regular part of your practice is to have the participants feedback on each other's work okay and there's various ways of doing that uh, in classes and making it happen you know it, uh, people are especially beginners especially when people haven't been in class before people are generally a uh, uh, very uh, unwilling uh, shall we say to say anything at all you know and even to get them to say something nice okay but it's like it's like everything else in in teaching you start slow uh, and you kind of sneak it in in a trojan horse way but eventually you've got to get everybody by week three week four week five uh, if you're doing one of those eight week courses or whatever you've got to get them all talking to each other about each other's work uh, and tinkering thinking critically about each other's work that's what means what they're doing because if they think critically about others work they become more uh, critical and reflective about their own work okay and the group working together that mutually understands each other and supports each other that's where the real teaching goes on you know and you, you, like uh, you, you when a class is really going well you are simply facilitating the group teaching each other you're not really doing anything except making sure that flow keeps going okay and you might come in with you know general remarks at the end okay so as a teacher you learn to use uh, you know uh, everybody else in the room as a teacher as well and that's kind of that's kind of crucial okay uh, so a, again that's your kind of team building thing and you is you build a good team you know you're letting yourself you, you, you're going to have a much easier job and the the, the 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 people who are involved in the group begin to take control of it and it moves much quicker and they come out feeling much better and you know you, you you've done a real good job as a teacher by by not being a teacher if you know what i mean okay the last thing uh, that i think is very important and uh, where again a lot of creative writing programs especially short-term ones uh, kind of uh, run out uh, and even in the universities where they do the MPhils you don't get anything like uh, is, when I would didn't MPhil anyway they didn't sit you down at the end and say well here's your options now this is what you can do a bit silly that they didn't do that really but uh, you know again it's it's kind of a lackadaisical like area a lot of the time uh, creative writing teaching and you know any bit of rigour uh, involved at all uh, uh, is an improvement okay one bit of rigour that a teacher should bring uh, is uh, what I call the oracular uh, you know, a fancily type the oracular role as a teacher there uh, is to provide a tailored creativity plan at the exit okay so again this is different for everybody okay if the class has gone well everybody's uh, creative capacity and their enjoyment and confidence in their own creativity has improved somewhat uh, to some degree uh, and then at the end of the 10 weeks you just they, they, there's a danger of them just being left hanging and not being creative again okay and in fact if that doesn't happen then the, mis the, 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 the experience even if it went well for a few weeks might end up kind of half damaging them because uh, they feel like they're not independent or they can't do it uh, so you should meet with each of the students at the end of your class and you should give them tailored advice about where they should go next for very few people that will be about uh, you know uh, going down the road of going for publication for most people it'll be about finding a way of fitting creative writing in a more uh, sustainable I would say uh, organic or you know if you want to be cynical about an amateur way uh, into their life but fitting it in nonetheless okay so that's all the different uh, 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 you know different types of approach and types of method overall you're going to use as a creative writing teacher. You're going to be an analyzer, find out as much as you can about your students. You're going to be a catalyzer and you're going to be a properly, you know, uh, 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 inspire them and challenge them and problematize their, their creativity so that it moves forward and they become more independent as time goes by. You're going to coach them. In other words, you're going to provide that sort of team spirit and make sure that team spirit uh, gets going and you're going to manage that team spirit uh, as much as you can as well and then at the end you're going to you know give them very strong uh, directional uh, you know advice because a lot of students do need directional advice uh, at the end and you're going to be you know helping them to continue with their creativity so that's all that's all and do study this section of the lecture a couple of times because it's a very important section of the uh, lecture thank you recap a little bit on a, a bit of theory and then uh, conclude the uh, this week's lecture with several profiling exercises uh, which I think are adaptable enough to use in any uh, circumstances uh, and I want to go back to the idea of uh, creativity as a, a an attribute of the group uh, and a collective or a cooperative or a collaborative uh, attribute rather than simply an individual one uh, and where that uh, kind of comes from uh, and what role that you can play uh, within that as, as, as a teacher okay uh, so going back again to our idea of a uh, creativity as a, a, an innate uh, evolved uh, human capacity uh, which evolves over the long 
uh, period of of human, the anthropological uh, history, if you like, of millions of years of hominids and humans uh, who lived in small groups and were confronted on a daily basis uh, with serious and critical problems that they had to solve uh, creatively uh, out of their embodied materials, as we spoke about, out of the skills and capacities and knowledge that they had, uh, together with what was to hand. Okay, so the problems were difficult but soluble, uh, and uh, over this long period of time, the neurochemistry. Uh, of creativity evolves and you know obviously if the uh, reward uh, for solving the problem is you're not going to be eaten by the lion or you're not going to be washed away in the flood or uh, these were the rewards for uh, for creativity group creativity uh, back in uh, back in the old 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 days you might say uh, the neurochemistry of that is quite obvious you get you know you get a, a good feeling you get a lift you get uplifted uh, by problem solving by being creative by solving the problem creatively that you've been presented with uh, so that there's a morale boost uh, from being creativity is neurochemically hardwired uh, by evolution into your brain and that's really you know the fundamental evolutionary reason uh, why it feels uh, why it feels good uh, for uh, for you to be creative and why people re report uh, you know increased well-being you know unanimously really uh, from engaging in uh, creative writing and other creative pursuits because we're neurochemically uh, hardwired to give ourselves a road to give to far to be given a, an internal chemical reward uh, which mimics you know the actual reward we used to get from you know not dying uh, from our immediate environmental threats if we solved the environmental uh, problem uh, properly okay uh, so uh, over time then we we developed this internal neurochemistry this neurobiology and we learned to use that uh, in the classroom okay uh, and we think of uh, you know and we use an awful lot we'll go into more detail about this but we use an awful lot of pair uh, group and whole class activities as well as individual activities in order to tap into that age-old cosmic you know creative positivity we have inside us when we work together with others uh, to solve problems so that's where the neurochemistry comes into and that's why we feel uh, happy um in group contexts, uh, you know, where, as we've talked about, uh, then where uh, creativity is encouraged, individuals will become more individually creative. Creativity is encouraged by creativity. The more creative the atmosphere is uh, around you, the more creative you will be yourself, okay? Just going really back over very quickly now, again, a point I want to slip in there is that, you know, pretty obvious uh, anthropologically and looking at things as an archaeologist or a historian or an evolutionary biologist, uh, you know, why uh, that the problems that humans were given to solve creatively originally very practical problems okay uh, so what problem does art solve uh, you might ask okay well I mean I think that the, the, it speaks for itself uh, art kind of evolves as well you know human beings didn't have art to begin with uh, and our oldest arts our body uh, arts painting ourselves you know uh, make makeup makeup is actually the oldest art form in, in the world uh, jewelry uh, song simple song simple dance simple ritual simple story all the things those things evolve over tens of times years in that group context uh, and uh, in that group context we learn to be creative in a group context uh, with, uh, uh, with with each other so I say okay so the problem that art solves is actually a problem of a, of a world becoming more complex and needing more uh, processing uh, needing more symbolizing uh, and needing you know more reflection in order for the individual to be able to understand as a whole so the great uh, era of uh, art explodes about 35,000 years ago in cave paintings all your, over Europe and we've had it ever since uh, you know since we, and it is about uh, emotional spiritual internal psychological developmental processes for the human individual going through life uh, more than it is about solving those immediate uh, problems but it does solve the problem of not being able to figure ourselves out it does solve the problem uh, of needing an outlet for excessive experience Experience, I would say an awful lot of creativity is because we've you know we've suffered something or we've we've undergone something and we need to process it and act as one way uh, for us to process the world and come to terms with the world uh, you know that uh, I, I, that we don't have another way of doing really you know and that's uh, and uh, that's that's where that's the problem it solves is often an individual psychological or spiritual uh, a problem but it is a problem uh, that needs to be solved and people will come to your class uh, looking to express themselves and looking to be creative and you'll find out if you talk to them the all the different motivations they've brought their own problem uh, if you like they want to record their memories for their grandchildren uh, they were involved in something 20 years ago that's very interesting or very terrible and they can't get over it and they nearly to get it out so all of these sort of problems will come along in the individuals within the group that you're going to build up into a great group flow
So their creativity, their individual creativity will be encouraged mightily by the creativity of the classroom as a whole. Therefore, uh, the most important thing for the creative writing teacher is to be creative themselves. You mustn't rely, as I've said already, uh, too heavily on textbooks or programmatic approaches to teaching creative writing. I don't trust or believe in any of the programmatic approaches to teaching creative writing uh, that are out there, uh, you know, uh, and you must at least in part design your own curriculum based on your knowledge, okay, what well, you know, what, what you know about creativity and your assessment of the particular group you're going to be working with. So you bring your whole self to it and then you also, you know, bring in what other people have got to bring. So, so uh, you know, the, the thing you really got to start doing uh, you know as soon as you can uh, is individually designing your own project games tasks you know all kinds of things for students to do the nature of which will depend again on the particular kind of group that you see yourselves work with and remember in our subsequent lectures we look at adults we look at teens we look at special groups we'll even take a little look at online teaching like this uh, for example okay uh, so the first task of the creative writing teacher to get to know your group and I've said it again I'll say it again and again because it's so important uh, is to find out as much as possible about the individuals that are in it and the group dynamic okay the group you're going to be working with how do you do this uh, that's not so easy you have to be a kind of a secret detective especially how do you do that if you're meeting a group for the first time or possibly even for the only time you're going to meet them do you hire a private detective no uh, you do it by creating writing games which are based on the life stories uh, of the people you're working with basically by getting personal but in a very subtle uh, you know and fun way uh, at, at the beginning uh, yeah teaching creative writing is all about being personal and about personally tailored curriculums and personally authentic expression uh, a phrase we'll come back to uh, when we're talking about teenagers again okay so I'm going to give you three exercises uh, that I've used uh, over and over again and I've used successfully uh, but I do encourage you to come up with your own exercise you're free to use these as much as you want or adapt these okay the first come back to something I said earlier on about the fertility of lies a uh, simply simple way of teaching that how we make stories is not they don't, don't we don't make up everything uh, we take a little bit of truth and we shake in a bit of lies and we mix it all around and then we get a story okay so that's a pair exercise you would do you would to pair stories student A with student B, student A with student B, say you have 14 students, you have seven pairs, uh, each of the students tells each other about an interesting social event that they have recently attended, uh, it could be anything, it could be a black mass, uh, it could be grandma's funeral, uh, it could be a book club uh, meeting, a, a camogie match, whatever it is, uh, and they tell the partner all, every detail they can think of, tell, not write, no writing, no note taking, anything like that, they listen carefully to each other, you instruct them to listen carefully to each other, uh, and then they tell the story of their partner in the first person. In other words, if, you know, I'm telling uh, John the story, John tells my story, and he pretends to be me. He doesn't say Dave did, he said I did, okay? So first person, the other person's story, so you're teaching a little bit about pretending to be somebody else there already, uh, and you're also, and people identifying and empathizing with the situation of other people, crucial part of creative writing, of course, uh, and you get them to add in at least three lies, okay? And those lies can be as mad or as subtle as you want, okay? usually works very well usually a good way to get people to talk about something which isn't all that uh, you know personal but is personal all the same and you find out a little bit about them uh, and that helps you to work then and you come back and you feed back in those exercises at the end so that's called the fertility of lies uh, another uh, exercise I do a lot with teenagers uh, is called basically just very simply called the freedom exercise okay uh, and you have a good chat with teachers about you know what does free what the, what does freedom mean to you is the first thing you ask them they'll all say different things uh, who's stopping you from being free and the kids will say you sometimes it'll depend where you are in the world uh, they'll say parents police teachers lack of money lack of responsibility all this sort of stuff and then you can say how uh, you know how are you going to get yourself free is part three that exercise and the kids start thinking practically then about well i'm going to move out of home or i'm going to do good leaving cert or uh, you know i'm going to <laughs> bomb the police station you don't know what's going to come up in the creative writing class actually kids did say that to me once and you know uh, fair play it's creative writing so you know you can basically say what you want as uh, shocking as it might be uh, to listen to okay uh, and uh, you then kind of raise it up but you say well look if you could do anything you wanted right anything at all you wanted if there were no laws of physics okay if there were no you know no restrictions whatsoever uh, what would you do uh, and you get some lovely answers to this question you get uh, you know I had a little girl once uh, a special needs girl and she said uh, that she would go to Paris and open a teddy bear shop which I thought was very beautiful uh, and uh, then you get another young fella said to me one time I'd bring back my granddad from the dead he said that was very sad but you know obviously something that he needed to bring out and he was comfortable bringing out himself it wasn't forced out of him if you know what I mean 
Uh, and uh, you know also I'd go back in time I'd fly around the place I'd stop time I'd you know all kinds of things I'd talk to animals whatever kids come up with all sorts of things that they want to do and then you get them to write as if that's true as if they can talk to animals if, if you bring it back your granddad well write, it, write a conversation you'd have what would you say to him write an interview him if you want to play on stage or you want to score the goal uh, in the hurling final which is when you often get uh, you know pretend that's happening to you pretend you have scored the hurling final and get them to write to explore their freedom and explore their motivations and begin to see their creativity is something which is about uh, you know almost evolving a second life or a second self for themselves or becoming the superhero of themselves or however way you want to put it but that's a very good one for, for kids usually as well uh, and then the third one that I use again with, with, with kids and uh, adults is you know a little bit more poetry to this one uh, it's called the I come from exercise and it, it's inspired by a group of young uh, poets in Leeds uh, and basically you get people to write down the sensual uh, impressions that their locality leaves on them. So you, you, you work with headings like smell. So what does your neighborhood smell like? Some say, you know, cigarettes, porridge, hops, you know, uh, curry, whatever. It depends where, you li- where you're living. Uh, what, what sites, what are the most impressive sites of the neighborhood? The, the big oak tree uh, at the bottom of the garden, you know, the crater in the middle of the road. Uh, what are the most impressive sounds? Drills or, you know, dogs barking or children crying or, you know, opera singers singing or whatever it is. Uh, and you go through all the senses like that and then they go back and you put I come from uh, before all those things so you say I come from the big oak tree at the bottom of the garden Uh, I come from the noise of drills I come from you know the mooing of cows I come from you know the scent of roses you make a nice long poem for them all to say where I come from and it introduces them to you know poetic language you know mixing things up and stuff like that and again very comfortable way for students to really for you to get to know something about them so there are just three exercises I use to quickly get to know my students quickly find out you know what their background is what they're into uh, what they like where you know and 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 then work out you know roughly uh, you know and uh, roughly what can I do with these people what are they most interested in how can I push them to uh, enjoy their creativity to, to the greatest degree possible